Alcohol. Thoughts on consumption of alcohol, which is a little generic. Okay. So I put this into a couple of categories. The first is just a purely physiologic, what is the effect of the molecule ethanol on the body? And just as I sort of talk about sugar or other things, it's really important to understand that ethanol is a toxin, but of course the dose makes the poison. Now, the thing that I think many people forget who are not in the world of toxicology is that there is a probability distribution that drives the impact of a toxin on a population. And there are going to be some people at one end of the spectrum who are largely unimpacted by certain toxins, and there are going to be others who are not. And so ethanol is no exception to that, just as, you know, Tylenol or pick your favorite poison could be. So Again, Tylenol meaning like even though it's at low doses, very efficacious as an analgesic, at high enough doses, it's hepatotoxic. So start with position one. I'm not convinced that there is a single benefit to ethanol, the molecule, in the human body. So ethanol in its metabolic pathway, and it's uniquely metabolized by the liver, one of the byproducts is something called aldehyde, which is a toxin. It really has two and this is a bit of an oversimplification, but it has two effects. So there's an effect on the liver and then there's an effect on the brain. The effect on the brain is what people drink alcohol for. It's the buzz. It's the CNS depression that also comes with some euphoria. So it's a bit of a paradox there because ethanol, its effect in the CNS is that of a, of a GABA agonist. And, and GABA, of course, being is a non-excitatory or a depressing neurotransmitter. But I think as most people will understand, certainly ethanol can have an excitatory effect. So you've got this brain effect of alcohol, you've got this liver effect. The liver effect is, you know, very similar to that of sugar or fructose. They have very similar metabolic pathways, not identical, but also not surprising that they overlap given that fructose is fermented to make ethanol. So from that standpoint, no benefit to ethanol, but again, different people tolerate it to different amounts. As a general rule, each beverage and I'm not talking the kind you pour yourself where they're a little longer, a little taller, but you know, like an ounce of distilled spirits is about 15 grams of ethanol. An appropriate, you know, maybe four ounce glass of wine is also about 15 grams of ethanol, as is a beer, you know, kind of like 10 ounces, 12 ounces, again, depending on the alcohol content. So as a general rule of thumb, each drink is about 15 grams of ethanol. One of the things, if a patient asks me this question that I'm thinking is, well, what's your liver function right now? And the best proxy we have for that is the ALT, one of the transaminases. And, you know, so when I see a patient that's walking around with an ALT that's already at the upper limit of what we consider normal by range today, which I do not consider normal, which is probably 42 on our lab, uh, I consider below 20 normal. I'm always asking the question, do they have fatty liver right now? And if they do, is it more in response to ethanol or is it more in response to fructose? That said, I have at least two patients that I've taken care of either in the past or currently who consume seemingly unbelievable quantities of ethanol, some of them averaging between eight and 12 drinks a day. And by ultrasound, their livers are normal. By LFTs, their livers are normal. Looking at COAG studies, every other marker you can look at, their liver function is perfect. And these guys are sort of the genetic outliers who have a remarkable tolerance to alcohol. So... The point I'm trying to make here is I want to get a sense of how much harm is coming purely in a, in a hepatic sense from alcohol and then make sure we're drawing a line well below that. But the second point is perhaps the bigger point, which is the why. The why are we drinking alcohol? And I say this as a guy who likes alcohol just as much as the next person, but certainly in my life I've started to ask, am I drinking just for the sake of drinking? Am I drinking because I'm trying to soothe some other issue? And does my drinking lead to a behavior that I'm otherwise not happy about? And in, in my case, personally, that generally tends to loosening the reins on what I eat. And I, I don't think I'm unique in that. I've got many patients that when confronted will say the same thing, which is, yeah, ultimately that's the problem with ethanol is you, you go out, you get a couple of drinks in you and things that you otherwise wouldn't eat, you just start eating. So not that this is at all scientific, but my rule of thumb is the following. As a general rule, I don't want to drink. If I'm going to drink, it's going to be good alcohol. I'm going to make it purpose-driven drinking. So I don't drink on airplanes because the alcohol sucks. Like I'm not going to, just because they're pouring me some half-assed glass of wine, I'm not going to drink it. 
But if I want to drink wine, I'm going to drink wine that is exceptional. If I'm going to drink tequila, I'm going to drink tequila that is exceptional. And if I'm going to drink beer, it's going to be exceptional. And because somebody's going to ask, what are my favorites? My favorite wine is Clio, which is a Spanish blend. And I've been drinking it since 2007. And I've had every bottle from 07 to 14. And I'm fully expecting that people listening to this are not going to go and start buying Clio like crazy because sometimes it's hard to find and I'm going to be really pissed off if I can't get it. Tequila, I know everybody raves about 1942 and I think it's good, but the Clase Azul Reposado is absolutely my favorite. It must be consumed neat. No ice, no lime, no nothing. And my favorite beer, I'm not willing to say what it is because it is so hard to find and honestly, not not to be a selfish prick, but I'm, I'm simply not willing to share it with anybody. One of the guys who works for me's part-time job is sourcing it across the United States and Belgium. So I'm sorry, guys, I'm not going to let on what that is. So that's my thoughts on alcohol. Okay. Any, can I make a follow-up question? Please. Okay. So more or less, you said there's nothing beneficial. I'm sure you're going to get, but what about, what about the French paradox? What about red wine? Isn't a glass of red wine, maybe two for men, maybe three, maybe six, depending on who you ask. Isn't that associated with better health or less cardiovascular disease or more longevity? Yeah. I mean, I think the the red wine thing came about through two things that you mentioned. One is the French paradox, which is, boy, the French seem to live a lot longer and they drink more. Ergo, it's got to be that. Of course, I think that to get into that topic in detail would sort of take the rest of our AMA. And it really has to do with just a poor understanding of epidemiology. So there are a lot of things that explain the French paradox. They also smoke more. I don't think that that necessarily means smoking is better. So it probably has a little bit more to do with what they eat than what they drink or don't drink. The other thing that I think has a lot of people with this lingering idea that, you know, a glass of red wine a day must be healthy. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying a a glass of red wine a day is harmful, but I'm saying it's it's not benefiting your health, is the resveratrol story. So resveratrol is a compound that is identified in very small quantities in red wine. And there was one lab in particular at Harvard that many years ago, and I say many years ago, like probably 15 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, David Sinclair's lab had studied this in high concentrations and they showed that it enhanced longevity. And that created like this huge wave of everybody wanting to take resveratrol supplements There are two issues with this. The first is, even if you believe those data, which I categorically do not, and no lab has ever been able to reproduce them, and I'm not even convinced that Sinclair today would believe that those were valid, you would not get that amount of resveratrol in a glass of red wine. So it's sort of like the, uh, should I be eating more dark chocolate to live longer? Eh, Maybe, but you're probably better off just taking cocoa flavonoids if you buy that that's the active ingredient that's going to enhance nitric oxide production. The the one thing I guess I'm glad you asked this follow-up question because I have some patients who will argue this, and honestly, maybe they're right, which is there are some patients who say, look, just a single glass of wine a day helps me unwind a little bit, and isn't there any benefit in that? And I guess the answer is possibly. And so the question is, does the net benefit of that, which could be a lower amount of cortisol, a lower amount of emotional distress, could those things be beneficial relative to any of the potential drawbacks of ethanol, such as you know, increased, you know, appetite dysregulation, or I'm not even getting into sort of pathologic behaviors. Maybe. One thing I have observed, and the aura ring has made it very easy for me to track this, is one drink in the evening does not impact my sleep. Two or more absolutely does, and does so in a profound way. The two things that happen are my resting heart rate will be 10 beats higher it will take very long for me to reach my resting heart rate. So what you want is your resting heart rate to be achieved within the first third of your sleep cycle. And more importantly, and perhaps more surprising to me, is my heart rate variability gets squashed. So I have a very low average heart rate variability when I have more than two drinks. And even the volatility of my variability is very low. And that is reflected in my sleep. Uh, It also definitely compresses REM cycles. So even though when you have a few drinks, you're groggy and you think you're sleeping better, you're just less conscious, but you're actually sleeping worse. 